Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Belko. I'm the Executive Director of Missouri Humanities. And I'm honored here today to have Peter Cousins, author and historian, who's written numerous books on Native American history, as well as his newest one on Tecumseh and his brother, that are known as the Prophet. Peter, welcome. Let me know uh, what moved you to write about uh, Tecumseh and his brother. Well, I had always uh, been fascinated with Tecumseh as the epitome of the great American Indian leader, considered by many to have been the greatest Native American leader. But I found that prior works on Tecumseh tended to neglect his brother, Tanks Watawa, better known as the Shawnee prophet, at least to whites. And there was an absence of uh, any attempt to integrate the lives of these two men and to really explore how they influenced one another. In fact, I had initially intended to write a biography solely of Tecumseh and do and uh, almost inadvertently fall into the trap of other historians, which is to relegate Tengsbatawa to second place. And I quickly realized that that couldn't be done and still maintain um, uh, fidelity to history because the two of them were co-equal in their influence and creation of this great pan-Indian alliance. Let's deal with the prophet then, since he seems to be dissed by history a little bit. Right. Um, what was his message? How did he come to that message? He was quite, a, quite an interesting character. And um, uh, one of the reasons why he's been dissed by history, as you put it, is because he was an unappealing figure, at least to white Americans of the day. He was a disfigured former alcoholic. He shot his right eye out with an arrow. Among his own people, he was known as, as he had a dissipated uh, drunkard uh, and a failed medicine man. And one day in 1805, he was sitting by the fire um, and he suddenly fell into a trance. He, he literally just toppled over in front of the fire. And for two days, uh, he couldn't be awakened. In fact, other his Shawnee friends and relations thought he was dead and were preparing to bury him. And then suddenly he, he came out of it and began to relate this incredible vision he had had in which the master of life, as the Indians called uh, God, had taken him to, to heaven and shown him the error not only of his ways, but also of the Shawnee and other tribes, the error of their ways that had led them into decline and into a, a, a loss of their uh, traditional societal values and into, into decline. And his message, there, he had many, uh, there are many tenets to it, but the, the essential creed was that to reclaim their dignity, uh, their way of life, the, the, um, uh, the Indians had to return to traditional ways. They had to eschew the almost all that they had received from white Americans, trade goods, uh, alcohol in particular, uh, cease having relations with Americans and, and return to a more traditional way of life. And that would allow them to, to, re, to reclaim what had once been theirs. And it was more of a, a religious and, and social creed for, for reinvigorating the Indian people along nativist lines. What uh, was different about the mission? What was Tecumseh's objectives, his mission, as maybe opposed to his brothers? It was a symbiotic relationship, no doubt about that. Without Tengswatawa, there never would have been a Tecumseh. Tengswatawa created the initial alliance around his religious and social and moral appeal. And Tecumseh, who I believe that genuinely considered his brother to be um, a prophet and to be in touch directly with the master of life. It, his brother had a greater interest in preserving 
Indian land from further American encroachment. Tecumseh's approach was to create um, or to, to kind of mold the social religious movement that his brother had begun and into a political and military alliance. They are leaders of a pan-Indian alliance at the time. Uh, define that pan-Indian alliance. So what was the successes? What were some failures of it? Tecumseh has sometimes uh, been incorrectly identified as a creator of the first pan-Indian alliance. And that's not, not the case. I mean, there were uh, ad hoc alliances or smaller alliances of various Indian tribes against first British encroachment and then American encroachment. You had Chief Pontiac in the 1760s opposing the British in the Midwest and uh, the East. He was followed in the 1790s by another um, Indian alliance under Chiefs Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. But those were more limited in scope. The, what made Tecumseh and Tangswatawa's alliance unique was the, the vastness of it. Uh, their, their alliance of, of disparate tribes stretched from uh, the upper reaches of the Mississippi River all the way down nearly to the Gulf Coast of Mexico. It literally encompassed almost half the United States. So they were able to draw on a much broader number of Indian tribes than had uh, leaders of previous Indian alliances. And to put it in perspective, you know, most people, when they think of a, an Indian alliance, you, you, you kind of default to Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and Little Bighorn, which was certainly the apex of Indian resistance in the West. But Tecumseh and Tengswatawa, at the peak of their alliance, actually had more than twice the number of warriors. It was the scope of it, the size of it, the, the breadth of it, the number of tribes that they were able to draw into their alliance that made that, them unique. And also the timing, mean, it was, it coincided with the War of 1812. It was really the last great Indian effort to stop the Western American Republic. How did they fail? What, what obstacles led to the failure? You know, they failed not on account of themselves, but on account of the British, the British allies. Uh, Tecumseh realized that he could not oppose the strength of the United States forces in the, in the old Northwest just with an Indian alliance, that he had to have the material support and the troop support of the British Army if he were going to succeed. And um, so initially, uh, Tecumseh and the British did quite well. They captured Detroit in 1812, they uh, took the entire Michigan territory, I mean, what it is today, the state of Michigan, and held it. And the British, of course, were limited in how many forces they could send to the United States because they were fighting Napoleon. But if the British had only diverted perhaps another one or two regiments, maybe 1,500 men to that theater of the War of 1812, they could very well have prevailed over the Americans. What obstacles did the brothers face among their own people, Native American? In the wake of the defeat of the alliance he predated them in 1794 at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, the Shawnee and most of the other tribes in that in uh, the, their immediate area where they had their villages uh, yielded to the Americans and began to transform themselves um, and to uh, uh, accommodate themselves to the American way of life, to farming, uh, and, and reject the uh, more militant approach of Tecumseh. They actually drew most of their support from tribes that had not felt or not been uh, defeated directly by the Americans. So they had, they had a, a, a rather fraught relation with their own people. They, they drew very relatively few Shawnee, for instance, into their movement. 
um, with part, partly because the Shawnee that he knew Kings Matawa best as a alcoholic, a drunk, a drunkard, a dissipated uh, non-entity, and they had a difficult time accepting him as a prophet. We know uh, Tecumseh made a southern uh, trip campaign, if you will, to rally the southeastern tribes, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee. Uh, he failed at that. What, what was the source of that failure? Right. Uh, Tecumseh traveled uh, in 1811 to visit uh, what were called, uh, have been called the civilized tribes, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Creek, who essentially uh, controlled almost all of present-day Mississippi, Alabama, western Georgia, uh, southeastern Tennessee. And he, he ultimately, he, he hoped to draw them into his alliance and create a, a, a movement of all the tribes east of the Mississippi River, not merely those north of the Ohio River, as considerable a number as those were. He failed uh, principally because the, with the exception of one element of the Creek tribe, the Indians of the South had moved quite far down the road toward accommodation. Um, the, the tribes of the South were slaveholding tribes. They held black slaves. They uh, had plantations that were often indistinguishable from those of their, their white neighbors. And uh, they had not, um, not really suffered yet from uh, American, from many American tents to push too deeply into their, into their lands. So, so with the exception of the Creeks who were already bifurcating into a, a more militant element that, that uh, I just saw the handwriting on the wall and recognized that they were losing, they're in danger of losing their way of life and their land to the Americans and an element of the tribe that had already accommodated to the Americans the, the remainder of the Southern tribes uh, rejected Tecumseh's appeal. But that element of the Creeks that accepted it, they um, in turn fomented, in the course of the next two years, fomented a civil war among the Creeks that exploded into a war with the United States that ultimately cost the Creeks um, their, their dominion over Western Georgia and Alabama and uh, kind of set things in motion toward the infamous Trail of Tears two decades afterwards. So Tecumseh, he, he did fail in his Southern pilgrimage. Not only did he fail uh, in achieving his own ends of, of broadening even further his alliance, but indirectly doomed the Creek Indians and the other Indian tribes of the South. So it was, uh, it was uh, a pretty tragic failure. What do you think are some of the life experiences uh, that you deem most influential to Tecumseh? They, as boys, they were compelled to, they were uprooted from their villages uh, four times by attacks from uh, Kentucky militia and brutal violent attacks that, uh, that essentially destroyed their hometowns and forced them to move. Uh, that obviously, that obviously was a tra traumatic, uh, were traumatic moments for both of them, uh, having to continually move, retreat deeper into, into their home country. The Shawnees as a tribe began to break up because of this and more than half of the Shawnee just literally picked up, left modern day Ohio and moved west to the Mississippi. And so they, they not only were they forced to, to move several times because they had been attacked, their villages had been attacked, but they also saw their, their, their people crumbling. And, and they were a small tribe, and just over 2,000 people to begin with. And as part of that, and what I find it could not have been anything but traumatic, was that among those Shawnee who decided to migrate west was their mother. And this was when they were both, again, 
when Tanks Watawa, I, I can't recall his exact age then, but I think maybe he was seven or eight years old, and Tecumseh was, was a young adolescent, she, she literally picked up and let, moved west to Mississippi with those Shawnees who quit the area and uh, dumped her sons on her eldest daughter, who was just married and who helped raise him. And I think those two factors could not um, have been other than traumatic for both of them. Despite that, neither developed a visceral hatred for white Americans. Uh, another very traumatic thing for both of them was the influence of alcohol, of liquor, on Indian society. I mean, the the, the Native American villages in the, in the in the Midwest were awash in, in liquor, and that uh, was the cause of Tanks Matawa's personal personal decline as a young man. But it also uh, was instrumental in the in the gradual unraveling of their societies. So I think they, again the, the the attacks that they, that they uh, sustained in their youth and the this, the uh, departure of their mother and the, the, the ubiquitousness of, of, uh, of liquor and its debilitating, demoralizing effects in their, in their societies. All those played, played a role um, in, in shaping their, in their characters. It's, I don't want to say widely known, but uh, the demise of Tecumseh in, in battle in Canada, um, I think he did a fantastic job with that. We do not know who Thank killed you. him. I know Richard right. Johnson always takes the Right, uh, the blame, um, but less is known about the demise of the prophet. Explain that a little bit. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to you know, put a spoiler alert into this, but actually, for me, that was in some ways, perhaps, as I was writing the book, um, the most moving aspect of the whole story. Because again, as you say, Tecumseh uh, died in battle in 1813, but Tanks Patawa lived on um, another two decades plus. And he had to grapple with the remnants of the Indian Alliance that were left after Tecumseh's death and the defeat of uh, the Alliance and the British at the Battle of the Thames in Canada. And it come to terms with, with the demise of the Alliance and also the, his declining influence as a prophet. And again, it's, it's really quite moving. Uh, and one of the things that helped me relate to him as a, as a human being was that, you know, here is a man who had been a, uh, a chronic alcoholic. He, he saw his movement um, destroyed uh, for the most part. He, he saw his brother killed in battle. Yet, Teng Swatawa did not, not only did not, himself revert to his dissipated way of life uh, previ previously, but he also, to an extent, was able to, to overcome the tragedy, and um, albeit with a much smaller following, he was able to come to terms with um, the changing of fortunes and the declining fortunes of the Indians in the Midwest, and to an extent, ad adapt to the new way of life. And he, uh, again, not to spoil the story, but he, he eventually settled in, um, in just outside of what is today, modern day Kansas City, Kansas. So he, uh, his life, he, again, went on for another two decades. And um, it was very poignant to see, to see his, his gradual, the gradual decline uh, of his influence, yet his ability to maintain his personal integrity uh, throughout. So he did not, you know, die gloriously a hero in battle as Tecumseh did. He had to cope with uh, two decades of life in which uh, his people had no chance of, of, of regaining their, their near glory during the days of his alliance with Tecumseh. You had to select uh, one nemesis of Tecumseh. Who would that nemesis be and why? Oh, okay. that's easy. William Henry Harrison, the future president of the United States who rode to victory on what he claimed to have been a victory over Indian forces led by Tanks Matawa 
at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, which I argue in the book was strategically a defeat for the Americans and was a manufactured victory uh, by Harrison. He did a very good job of propagandizing on his own behalf. But it was Harrison who, as the governor of the Indiana Territory and the uh, supervisor of Indian Affairs for, again, for most of what is today the present day Midwest, he was charged with putting into execution Thomas Jefferson's policy, which essentially was twofold. It was to, quote, civilize, unquote, the Indian tribes, convert them into farmers, convince them to not only to abandon the uh, hunt and that way of life, but also to be to become so in, indebted to uh, American merchants as they became farmers, became acculturated, that they would be compelled to trade land, sell land to be able to maintain a, a, a decent standard of living. Uh, and it became incumbent upon Harrison to implement this strategy. So he very aggressively, between 1803 and 1809, just bought up Indian land throughout the Midwest, more often than not through very shady dealings. Uh, and it was ultimately his refusal to abide by the terms of a treaty negotiated um, uh, in 1805 and a push that he made to incorporate even more Indian land in 1809 that led to come Tawa to become fully militant, for lack of a better word, in their opposition to, to, uh, to American encroachment. They had, Tecumseh had laid down a, a line in the sand that if the Americans push beyond a certain point uh, in what is today uh, Indiana and Northern Ohio, then he would be forced to, to oppose the Americans uh, militarily. And uh, even though there was no need at the time for Harrison to negotiate that one last treaty, uh, to boost his own kind of precarious political fortunes, he negotiated this treaty uh, in a rather nefarious way, and that led ultimately to, to uh, the Battle of Tippecanoe and, and open conflict with the Indians. So William Henry Harrison was definitely, the, definitely their nemesis. On the flip side, who might have been Tecumseh's uh, greatest influence on him? Tanks Matawa himself, uh, later in life, in interviews with um, uh, the governor of Michigan Territory, this is again late, later in life after Tecumseh's death, he uh, acknowledged his own debt to Chief Pania, who opposed the British attempts to reduce assistance to the Indians and to uh, renege on treaty promises. It would, and the alliance that Pontiac created was based partly on religious and social tenets of a Delaware prophet named Neolin. And uh, so the combined influence of Neolin and Pontiac and the near success they had in expelling the British from what is today the Midwest served as a model for Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh. Uh, there was only um, you know, a, a generation removed from Pontiac and Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh and, and the stories of, their, of, of, of his, his glories certainly uh, were told to the youthful Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh. So Pontiac and the Delaware prophet Nahalin were clearly direct and important influences on, on both of them. The book, uh, the research and um, your, your study of, of the brothers, has it, uh, I guess, influenced you to take another step and do some more Native American histories? As a matter of fact, yes. I'm uh, well underway in writing a book, uh, the tentative title of which is Red Sticks and Old Hickory. The Creeks, Andrew Jackson, and America's Most Brutal Indian War. So I'm, I'm following on the, the, the heels of Tecumseh and the Prophet and uh, essentially writing about what transpired south of the Ohio River 
during that era that culminated in, in the Creek War, the ascendance uh, of Andrew Jackson on the national scene, and the eventual uh, Trail of Tears of the, the civilized tribe. Fantastic book. I've enjoyed it. Hopefully maybe we can do this again. Maybe we can do it in person. I certainly hope so.